I recently saw an article claiming that cycling was bad for the economy. Now to be fair, I think this was a bit of an ironic joke, especially if by economy you mean big corporate business that's hell-bent on turning us all into slaves. Yes, that economy. Essentially, the article hinged on the premise that us cyclists don't need to buy petrol or gas to fuel our bikes, nor do we need to pay road tax or car insurance. It even went on to say that because cycling is also good for our general health, we're less likely to suffer from conditions such as heart disease and high blood pressure, and therefore we'll take fewer drugs and won't need to pay for medical insurance and hospital bills as much as our more sedentary counterparts. Mind you, this was a US article. If it was a British one, where NHS hospital treatment is completely free, I could easily imagine the same article arguing that because we live longer, we would put a greater strain on the state and the planet's limited resources in general as we age. Well, how on earth is the big corporate machine going to survive if we don't do what they want? Now, while I was looking into this article, I also found one entitled Ban the Bike, because basically the author argued it was bad for the environment. Yes, you heard me right. Sadly, this one was deadly serious, and one that I felt I had to share. If you'd like to read it in full for yourself, I've included the link in the description below. To begin with, it was headed up by a ridiculous image containing pretty much every anti-cycling cliche you could think of. A man riding a fixed wheel bike at speed without a helmet while looking down at a mobile phone and listening to music. The only thing missing was a cute little kitten being squashed under the wheels of his bike. Even I hated him. Writing in the Canadian Financial Post in December 2017, Lawrence Solomon claimed that there is a secret backlash to the cycling as city transport debate because, and I quote, cycling lanes consume more space than they free up, add to pollution and drain the public purse. Now, if I've understood it correctly, Solomon argues that the problems start when existing road space is taken up to create cycle lanes that don't actually succeed in removing motorists from their cars. Using London as an example, he says that cars have to be squeezed into the narrow space that remains, and traffic is reduced to a crawl. As a consequence of idling vehicles, pollution levels have risen, contributing to what is now deemed a toxic stew. He further adds that, ironically, cyclists are at a greater risk of breathing in this pollution, because not only are they at exhaust pipe level when they use the cycle lane, but because they're also breathing harder and faster as they ride. At first glance, you can kind of understand his logic, but I've been driving in London ever since I've had a driving licence. And not to put too fine a point on it, it's always been a congested nightmare, even before the bike lanes. Furthermore, I would argue that generally speaking, the bike lanes in London have not reduced space on the roads to the point where a vehicle is unable to overtake a cyclist, or even move freely. Granted, there are one or two places where it has, but these are few and far between. The problem is that traffic in central London never moves freely bikes or not. And as for the cycle lanes not being used, all I can say is that from what I've seen they certainly are. Okay, I'll grant you that they might not have taken as many motorists off the road as first thought, but no one drives in London unless they absolutely have no other choice. Solomon goes on to list several cities around the world and how much each is investing in cycling infrastructure, further saying, and I quote, In a user pay or market economy where users pay for the services they consume, bicycle lanes would be non-starters outside college campuses and other niche settings. If roads were told to recover the cost of asphalt and maintenance, no cyclist could bear the burden he foists on society. The cyclist has been put on the dole, 
made a taker rather than a giver to society. Now I feel this is just another version of the age-old cyclist and road tax argument, but perhaps what Mr Solomon is not taking into account is the fact that it's the government in these places pushing for the cycle lanes and not the cyclists, and they wouldn't be doing that if they couldn't see some kind of long-term benefit. I would say that the majority of the cyclists in London at least are getting on their bikes for all the right reasons, basically to reduce pollution, to remove a vehicle from the road and to be healthier, therefore reducing the burden on the NHS. In short, I would say that they're saving the country and indeed the world far more than it costs to build the cycle lanes, and the number of cyclists is only set to rise, representing an even bigger return on this investment. And to top it all off, Solomon also claims that per kilometre travelled, cyclist fatalities are eight times more than that of motorists. Now, sadly, he does have a very strong point here, but is this a fault of the cyclists? Granted, I've seen with my own eyes how some cyclists have no regard for their own safety or the safety of others, but equally many motorists don't even see cyclists until they've hit one. I think all we can do as cyclists is take responsibility, obey the rules of the road and be as courteous as possible to all other road users. When we jump red lights or even hurl hysterical abuse at motorists, we just give people like Lawrence Solomon one more reason to feel justified. If you want to be a bit zen, think about this. Not spending money on petrol, car tax and motor insurance, not spending money on drugs and hospital bills, and not sitting in traffic jams, but instead Riding your bike and living a long, happy and healthy life is actually an act of rebellion. If that's the case, I plan on living forever. Maybe longer. Thanks for watching.